Therefore, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, uh, Minister of the Crown made a $150 million announcement. That's no small amount of money. So what was the minister's response when she was asked where the money was coming from? She said, this is a direct quote, I'm actually not quite sure where it's coming from. What? Can you believe that, Mr. Speaker? She actually said she had no idea where the funds were coming from. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier tell us where the money is coming from for that announcement? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, let me uh, let me just make a, a shout out to the Minister of Community and Social yeah, Services. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, the idea of a, a basic income has been around for a very long time, and uh, the Honourable Hugh Siegel, who the, uh, the, some members in the party opposite might know, um, has been talking about this and has worked with researchers. And to have to Member have the from Bruce and Sound. Speaker, as a government to put in place a pilot project on a basic income at a time when work is uncertain, Mr. Speaker, when we have a global economy that is uncertain, we know that. Finding the data, getting the information from this basic income pilot is extremely Answer. important, not just here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, but internationally. There's a great deal of attention being paid to the outcomes of the basic income pilot, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and I didn't get an answer on the question of where the funds were going to come from. The Minister of the Crown had Chief government no idea. Mr. Speaker, the reality is, and this might be a news flash for this government, but money doesn't grow on trees. It actually has to come from somewhere. And the spin afterwards by the government saying it could come from the budget. The budget doesn't produce money. The budget doesn't pay taxes. The budget doesn't pay fees. Taxpayers pay fees. Taxpayers work hard. And to have a government right now that is completely disrespectful to taxpayer funds, making announcements with no idea how they're going to pay for them. Mr. Speaker, I'd like Minister to get of the, housing. the government made an announcement yesterday. They had no idea where it's coming from. Can the Premier show this legislature the decency to tell us where that $150 million is going to come from? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to uh, Thursday, Mr. Speaker, when it will be laid out very clearly how our balanced budget builds on the platform, Mr. Speaker, that we have put in place over the last number of years. We have been working very hard, Mr. Speaker, to get to the point where we could invest in uh, the people of this province, which we have been doing all along. But to balance the budget, Mr. Speaker, actually gives us the opportunity to to take the next step to further invest in the people of this province and do the things that we know are necessary in order to build the inclusive economy that we know is necessary for this province and for the people who are struggling with uncertainty, Mr. Speaker. Now, I'm not surprised that the Leader of the Opposition doesn't support the basic income pilot. I'm not surprised at all, because this is a party that has a history of cutting public services, Mr. Speaker, of actually undermining the foundation of uh, the social safety network and the, the services that have delivered been delivering this province. But this is a good thing, Mr. Speaker. Seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Without comment. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, if the Liberals were sincere about their announcement, they would have had some idea of how they're going to pay for it. The reality is, after 14 years, Ontarians work harder, they pay more, and they get less in Liberal Ontario. The cost of everything is going up. So it worries me, Mr. Speaker, when they make announcements with no clue of how it's going to be paid for. But if there's one thing I know about this Liberal government, if there's one thing they're good at, it's raising taxes. So when they make an announcement with no clue how it's going to be paid for, the reality is it's new taxes. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier assure us they're not going to pay for this announcement through new taxes? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, what I can assure the member opposite of is that we, are, we will be bringing in a balanced budget on Thursday, Mr. Speaker, a balanced budget that will allow us 
to make investments in the lives of people in this province. And a basic income pilot, Mr. Speaker, is part of that, making sure that uh, we have the evidence to demonstrate whether such a such a, uh, uh, an initiative would actually be uh, would be able to be uh, rolled out across the province, Mr. Speaker. Whether it would help with the precarious employment and the realities of displacement because of technology, Mr. Speaker, because of because of the change of changing nature of work, Mr. Speaker, this is a huge opportunity Answer. to get evidence that will help us to make good decisions going forward, not just us, but internationally, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. We know the Liberal government gave the Gandalf Group over $3 million of taxpayers' money to complete polling. And let's just remember the Gandalf Group is led by the Liberal Premier's campaign manager, David Hurley. So, Mr. Speaker, can we get some assurances today from the Premier that this thank you to David Hurley ended at the three million mark? Can the Premier assure us no more taxpayer money is going to be used to fund the Gandalf Group? Premier? Just a sec. I have to give it to you. President of the Treasury Board. <laughs> President of the Treasury Board. We will sort this out. Thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, the, uh, the Government Advertising Act is very, very clear. If we, if the, the people who get government, adverti government advertising contracts actually go through a competitive procurement process. So if anybody, any firm, has a contract to do government advertising, that firm has gone through a, through a procurement process. Some of them might have been liberal. Some might have Tory ties, some might have NDP ties, some might have no ties. It doesn't actually matter because what they all have in common is that they go Answer. through a public procurement process. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I can appreciate why the Premier doesn't want to be on the record Absolutely. on this. Three million dollars to the Gandalf Group. Three million dollars, wow. and the minister wow. says there's a strict process to determine who gets these polling contracts. Yeah. Is the qualification to be on the Liberal campaign team? That's because right. Right. this doesn't add up. The reality is the research that has been released publicly. They're not even using the polling. The polling said 70% were against the fire sale of Hydro One. They don't care. They proceed. It said. 84% of people oppose ending coverage of some health care services, and they cut the budget of physicians anyways. Wow. So if you're paying millions of dollars wow. in polling, you don't use the polling. The impression that's left, this is simply a thank you to your campaign manager. Right. Be honest with the people of Ontario and explain why the $3 million was spent on the Liberal campaign Person. manager. Thank you. Have you seen it, please? Have you seen it, please? Thank you. President? Yes, thank you, and my apologies. You're usually asking about advertising. Sorry, I didn't catch it was polling. But in fact, the answer is actually the same. If you are going Remember to from do the market research for the government, you must go through a competitive procurement process. And the Gandalf Group, like absolutely anybody else who does market research for the government of Ontario, whether that's a Liberal government from Leeds, or a Tory government or an NDP government has gone through a competitive finish please Where, and the uh, decisions about which vendor is suitable after there's an additional bid the uh, finalists uh, actually Answer. go through a committee process, which is a bureaucratic process, not a government process or a political process, to arrive at the. Thank you. Final supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I'd appreciate if the Premier could uh, answer this for the House. You Member know, from Beaches, this East York. Liberal thank you program where millions of dollars go out to the Liberal campaign officials, in this case, the campaign manager. One of the questions they actually polled was interesting. It said that they're asking what the public support would be for raising the HST. And of course, the vast majority of Ontario, 69%, opposed the idea. But given the fact they've ignored all the previous polling, can we now assume that we're going to see a, a, a raise in, in the HST? Can the wow. Premier assure the House today that the HST is not going to be raised? Yes, thank you. And, and apparently the member opposite hasn't quite understood yet that this is a competitive process. We have a number of vendors of record on our, our market research vendor of record list. So, for example, and I'm quoting from the 2014-15 public accounts, which you have access to, uh, the uh, other market research in, uh, included forum research, Ipsos research, Read, Strategic Council, ECOS Research, and Veronics Research, Harris Dexima Research. Oh. So it isn't just one firm. A variety of firms have been the winner when it comes to competitive procurement of government contracts Answer. for market research. In fact, it doesn't matter what you procure, it is a competitive procurement. Thank you. New question, the member from Beverly Gorn Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The question is to the Premier. More than two million Ontarians do not have drug coverage. One in four Ontarians cannot purchase the drug medications that they need to save their lives. Ontario is one of the wealthiest provinces, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. It's simply unacceptable with the current situation. People are going without the medication that will save their lives. This is just unbelievable. Does the Premier think that it's okay for this to go on in our province? Mr. Speaker, you know, as a government, we know how critical it is for uh, the people of Ontario to have access, access to affordable and quality health care close to home, and that includes uh, that includes uh, pharmacare, Mr. Speaker. Um, we uh, we believe that increasing access to pharmacare is a good idea, and we understand that this is an extremely important issue for the people of Ontario. And the minister of uh, the minister of health has uh, has been engaged in this conversation across the country, Mr. Speaker. We understand that this is a very important idea, and I uh, appreciate the question from the member. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, New Democrats believe in national pharmacare, but we've been waiting for national pharmacare for 50 years. If Tommy Douglas had waited for the federal government to act, we would have American-style health care here in Ontario. I don't think that people should have to wait. I don't think that people should have to wait for the federal government to act in order to have access to medication that will save their lives. Ontario New Democrats are going to do something about it. That's why we've announced our plan for pharmacare. How long is this government going to have people wait before they get the coverage for life-saving medication that they need so desperately? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I know the uh, the member opposite knows uh, just uh, <coughs> my own views on this and the views of this government that we uh, we believe that how critically important it is that Ontarians and Canadians across this country have access to uh, the drugs that they need, the uh, prescribed medications that will keep them well, Mr. Speaker, or will get them well if they fall ill. Uh, it's uh, an issue that the Premier has been championing for a long time. Uh, and I'm really pleased, Mr. Speaker, that after three years of our advocacy on the national stage, that the NDP has finally decided to come to the table and joining our efforts to provide that access because Mr. Yeah, Speaker, sorry. because they haven't addressed Welcome this publicly aboard. prior to, to just you. very recently, Mr. Thank you. Fantastic. Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe our health care system, New Democrats believe our health care system should include medical coverage. People should not be able should not be in a situation where they cannot access life-saving medication that they need. 
People shouldn't have to wait for Ottawa to maybe one day, hopefully, get its act together. Why does the Premier think that it's okay that people are waiting to receive this desperately needed coverage, to receive the coverage that they need right now? Thank you. Minister? 2020. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, I know that, uh, that this is an important issue to this government. It's an important issue to me as a health care practitioner. And I had the opportunity, I was just reviewing the, uh, you know, I wrote an op-ed way back in December of 2014 uh, that spoke to my own experience as a physician uh, because of the practice that I've worked in uh, for over 20 years uh, is exclusively immigrants and refugees, primarily from the Horn of Africa. And they're individuals that are of lower socioeconomic uh, status, Mr. Speaker. And I spoke of the many, many times where I knew if I gave a prescription to those individuals, those families, it was unlikely that they would have the resources to fill it. Or I would have to go into my sample drawer to actually provide them with a sample prescription because I knew they couldn't afford to get it from Answer. the pharmacist. I understand how vitally important access to medicines is. And I, I, again, I welcome their recent advocacy on this issue. Yeah. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Nickelbelt. Thank you to the Premier. And again this morning, the Minister of Health agreed with then my leader and NDP that pharmacare is the unfurnished business of Medicare that was envisioned 51 years ago. New Democrats, we want to finish that business. We want people to get the life-saving medication that they need. And we are ready to do something about it. Why are the Liberals? Thank you. Mr. Health Long Term Care. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I'm proud of many of the activities that this government has been responsible for uh, when it comes to prescription drugs. Uh, 170,000 more seniors no longer paying the $100 annual deductible. Minister. Mr. Speaker, 170,000 more seniors in this province since last year's budget uh, receiving their medications without any annual deductible at all and with the co-payment reduced from $6 down to $2 per prescription. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm proud of the work that we've been doing nationally with the Pan-Canadian yes, Pharmaceutical Alliance as well, where we nationally have saved over $700 million through bulk purchasing and bulk Thank negotiating, you. Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. The Premier may want to wait for her federal cousin, but Ontario cannot afford to wait. We cannot, we cannot afford not to have pharmacare. Right. Does the Premier believe people in Ontario should have universal access to medication? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, we announced earlier this year that we would be providing hepatitis C uh, treatment to anyone with a diagnosis of hepatitis C infection uh, at a cost, Mr. Speaker, of hundreds of millions of dollars to, to Ontarians, but it's a this is almost a cure. In 95 percent of the cases, it results in a cure, and it's a dramatic new development in, the, in this field of treatment of hepatitis C. These are the kinds of investments that we're making, and we're constantly adding medicines to our formulary as the evidence proves their efficacy and their value in treating and providing uh, that important treatment to Ontarians. Uh, and, um, and Mr. Speaker, last time I checked it, because we would welcome not only the advocacy here, but last time I checked, Alberta does not have a, national, does not have a pharmacare program either. Yes, sir. We would appreciate their advocacy in talking to their cousins in Alberta on this important issue. Thank you. Well, supplementary. Well, Speaker, my question was about universal access. When people get the medication they need, we all agree it saves lives. But the Liberals have left Ontarians waiting and waiting and waiting even longer for the drug coverage that they need. Pharmacare isn't something that people should be waiting for. New Democrat, we get that. And we're ready to do something about it. Why don't the Liberals get it? Thank you. Minister. 
So, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, uh, um, you know, it's clear our government's position on access to medicines is crystal clear. That for many years now, we have uh, pointed out the fact that uh, one out of ten Canadians, probably uh, one out of ten or more Ontario families, uh, are unable to access the medicines that they need because. Uh, of financial limitations, Mr. Speaker, and that's not right. And that's why we have so strongly advocated for increasing that access, or why we uh, continue to advocate for it. And we take measures like we did last year: 170,000 more seniors that no longer have to pay a hundred-dollar deductible, no longer pay that six-dollar uh, co-payment. It's now two dollars. These are the kind of measures. But I appreciate. The advocacy that Member from Ancaster, come to order. Wrap up sentence. I just, I'm glad the NDP has come to the table. We need their help as we continue to improve access to medicines. Here, here. New question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, Section 20.1 of the Local Health Systems Integration Act 2006 prohibits local LINs from restricting or preventing the individuals from, Hamilton, from receiving services based on the geographical area in which they live. I've been assured by numerous senior sources of both my local LIN and riding, as well as ministry staff, that LIN boundaries would never prevent or interfere with one's right to access decent and proper health care in this province. Speaker, is the minister aware of any deviations from this specific Ooh. policy? Oh. <laughs> well, clearly the member opposite has one, and I'm going to hear about it in the supplementary. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, there, it's important to reiterate to this House as well as to Ontarians that that what, at least in his first question, what the member opposite has stated is true: that there are no boundaries in terms of access to medicine. So, an individual, perhaps that resides in Thunder Bay, is welcome to access the health services that are available in uh, in the Sick Kids Hospital or Ottawa Civic Hospital. That there. There are no restrictions for any type of community service that's provided, rather health care uh, service that's provided. I'm interested in the supplementary. I suspect I'm going to hear uh, of a concern, and I'm going to preempt to some degree the member opposite by saying I want to work with you because that is not permitted in this province, and let's let's find a way to uh, address it effectively. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Supplementary, the member from Manor Park, Lennox and Addington. You're, you're, you're absolutely correct, Minister. We do have an example. <laughs> uh, on April 21st, the Ottawa Hospital sent out this memo uh, informing doctors in my writing that the Department of Medical Imaging's breast imaging program is experiencing significant delays. Their solution, as outlined in the memo, would be that they will only accept patients from the Champlain Lynn region. This, is in, this prevents people in my riding from going to Ottawa to get necessary services. It is in direct conflict with the minister's statements, and it's in direct contradiction to the legislation. Speaker, will the minister direct the Champlain Lynn of Agriculture. and the Ottawa Hospital to accept patients from outside their Lynn and contact the doctors in my riding and assure them that this memo Question. is false and has no effect. And if I could send the memo over to uh, have a page, page memo over. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, I'm delighted to uh, to receive this information, and I look forward to uh, to seeing the memo. Frankly, I kind of like it as well when members asked to speak with me directly or grab me at the end of question period and, and solve a problem. Uh, but you know, I appreciate that there might be an, uh, an ambition to, to score a political point at the same time. I'm interested, I'm interested, Mr. Speaker, in solving problems, and I think almost every member on that side of the legislature knows or even has personal experience of how hard I've worked with them to try to improve or augment or correct health services in their jurisdictions. That's the way I work as health minister. I'm happy to work on this particular issue. I know we've dramatically expanded breast cancer screening services across this province under the previous health minister who's sitting to my left, Mr. Speaker. Answer. And I would anticipate that those services are available uh, over a wide swath of that region, but I'm going to look into it specifically. Your question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. 
Speaker, thank you. My question to the Premier. Late last week, the government quietly announced that it had approved massive increase in the salary ranges for OPG executives. The top salary of the OPG CEO is now $3.8 million, wow. which is double his current salary. Wow. Wow. Meanwhile, starting next week, ratepayers who've been unable to pay their hydro bills will start losing their electricity. How does the Premier explain to families who may lose their electricity why they have to pay more to give an OPG CEO a 100% increase in salary? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, once again, when it comes to uh, OPG salaries, Mr. Speaker, um, we do have a framework in place to ensure that they are um, paid com um, uh, comparatively, Mr. Speaker, and paid fairly. And when we have people running our nuclear facilities, Mr. Speaker, and having a 40-year history of safety, we want to ensure that these people are paid not at the top, Mr. Speaker, not at the bottom, but paid right in the middle of the pack within their sector. When it comes to looking at uh, rates that are happening for uh, folks right across the province, Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to hear um, last week that the Ontario Energy Board's decision will begin to lower rates even further on May 1st in anticipation, Mr. Speaker, of our government's Fair Hydro Plan. So that's going to mean on May 1st the OEB's decision will have rates reduced by 17 per cent by May 1st, and while the opposition parties have like a pamphlet for their plan, we're Supplementary. Again, to the Premier. It's not surprising that a Premier who thinks ratepayers should pay twice as much for the OPG CEO also thinks ratepayers should pay twice as much for hydro. The connection between skyrocketing hydro CEO salaries and skyrocketing hydro disconnections could not be clearer. It speaks to the values of this government, which treats hydro ratepayers as cash cows for senior executives, for private financiers, and for other friends of the Premier, at the same time dismissing the struggles of ordinary Ontarians until, of course, this government is backed into a political corner. That's right. Why does the Premier always put the interests of the executive class ahead of the needs of ordinary Ontario families. Why? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise and talk about how this Premier and this government is putting the needs of Ontarians first, Mr. Speaker. Not on the last page of their plan like the third party, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that First Nations, that their delivery charges are addressed. They don't even mention First Nations, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to offering help. This Premier and this government, Mr. Speaker, have done that. Finish, please. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. So when it comes to the Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, we increase that by 50 percent, Mr. Speaker, ensuring ensuring that families and individuals that are struggling when it comes to their electricity prices will receive more help, Mr. Speaker. That is what this Premier Answer. and this government does. On that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, they have no plan and they can't even make up a thank plan you. that works. Mm -hmm. question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. It's no secret that the housing market in the Greater Golden Horseshoe has experienced dramatic price increases in recent months. We have all seen the stories reporting that housing prices in Toronto are up 33 per cent from this time last year. But, Mr. Speaker, while our hot housing market is tied to the confidence people have in the Ontario economy, we know that many are struggling with housing affordability. In my own riding of Davenport, I've heard from so many hard-working young families about the difficulty that they're having entering the housing market. So just last week, I was so proud to stand by the Premier as she, along with yourself and the Minister of Housing, announced the introduction of Ontario's Fair Housing Plan. 
Mr. Speaker, this announcement was wonderful news for the constituents in my riding of Davenport, who are working so hard every day to Portia. purchase a safe and affordable place to call home. So could the minister please share with my constituents and the, all the members of Thank this you. house what this plan means? Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the member from Davenport who attended that uh, press conference and has navigating and fighting not only for uh, supporting those who are renting and who are being subject to uh, to valuations beyond their control, but also trying to advocate for young families, get a start at home, and enabling them uh, to get some equity built in their homes. And given the spike and the great increase year over year that's occurred, she's been advocating alongside this caucus to find ways to temper the marketplace by going after those speculators who are with deep pockets, crowding out those very families that are trying to get a start. So I congratulate her and our team and our caucus for finding ways to cool the market to ensure that everybody has a better chance. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the minister for his answer. I know my constituents in my riding of Davenport were also excited to hear that Ontario is also proposing to expand rent control as part of the Fair Housing Plan. This is an issue I've had the pleasure to write to the Ministry of Housing about previously and most recently in February. Minister, as you are aware, many tenants across the GTA, including in my riding of Davenport, have been faced with unacceptable rent increases. In one case, tenants in the south end of my riding received a shock when their rent on their two-bedroom condo nearly doubled from $1,660 a month to $3,320 a month. With so many of my constituents in Davenport and right across the Greater Golden Horseshoe living in rental housing, it is so important for our government to let those people know what that Question. economic inventions are unacceptable. Speaker, through you to the minister. Minister. Minister of Housing. Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. And, and to the member for her question, she has indeed been a tireless advocate on this important issue. Yeah. Speaker, we've heard stories of unreasonable and shocking uh, uh, rental hikes in today's market. Stories like Pauline, who lives in Toronto, and told me that she's fearful that her family will be forced out of their condominium due to an unreasonable rent hike. Speaker, stories like Pauline and her family is why we introduced rent the, the Rental Fairness Act yesterday in the House. Here, if here. passed, Speaker, our bill will expand rent controls to all private rental units, including those built after 1999. In addition, this bill includes a suite of other measures that protect tenants. Speaker, by passing this bill, a quarter of a million people would be protected from Answer. unreasonable rent hikes. Speaker, whether you're a senior on a fixed income or a young person just starting off, all Thank Ontarians you. deserve rent that's affordable. Thank you. New question, the member from uh, Stormont Dundas, South Hungary. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Health. The health of Ontario's hospitals is suffering from a critical lack of funding. Cornwall Community Hospital occupancy rates are so high, patients have to be accommodated in hallways, empty office spaces, or any cubby holes staff can find. Yet ministry people dismiss the concern, saying the real number really happens at midnight. Would this minister really stand next to a senior heart attack patient and tell them on a, in a stretcher in the hallway and tell them that they really only count if they're still alive that night? Thank you, Minister of Health. Well, uh, well that's a bad Mr. Question. Speaker, uh, of course, as the member opposite knows, we've made uh, substantial new investments in our hospitals uh, on two fronts, Mr. Speaker. On the operating side, we've increased uh, the operating budgets by about 3 per cent uh, this year alone, Mr. Speaker, uh, close to $500 million. And on the capital side, Mr. Speaker, we've made I, what I believe I'm confident is the largest, most substantial capital investment in hospitals in this province's history, uh, $12 billion over a 10-year period. Uh, and we're seeing the results of both of uh, those actions, uh, where uh, in many cases quite dramatic increases in hospitals' operating budget uh, budgets, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, uh, we yes, referenced sir. the uh, member from Halliburton Court, the Lakes, uh, her hospital, yeah, the Halliburton 10%. Hospital, getting a 10% increase in her operating budget yeah. last year. These are important investments, Mr. Speaker.
Parliamentary. Thank you. Back to the minister. <coughs> Speaker, the Cornwall Community Hospital reported occupancy rates as high as 138 per cent this year, with a high incidence of alternative level care of patients facing longest wait times in Ontario for proper placement. Yet when questioned, the government says they have twice as many beds as they need until uh, 2030. Someone doesn't know what's going on, and it isn't the waiting patients. Ministry, if, the figure, if as your figures say, we have too many beds, then, we either, then why are the ALC patients in Cornwall waiting over a year to be placed? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I feel like it's perhaps a two-part answer that is required here. When it comes to Cornwall Community Hospital itself, I'm proud to say that uh, we increased their operating budget by over $4 million yet last year. That was a 5.4 per cent increase in the operating budget for that hospital alone. And When it comes to long-term care and, and ensuring that uh, residents of Cornwall and the surrounding region have a place to live, that's why we're making our investments where we've, since coming into office, have built more than 10,000 brand new uh, long-term care uh, beds, where we're redeveloping an additional 30,000 beds uh, between now and 2025, Mr. Speaker. But we're also looking at other opportunities to ensure, whether it's in the home or in the community or in long-term care or in the hospital, where uh, patients and clients are yes, getting the highest quality of care uh, at the best possible place for them and where they want to be, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Bradley Gormolton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. After nearly 14 years of Liberal government, for far too many working, hardworking Ontarians, good-paying full-time jobs are a thing of the past. What have they been left with with, these, with this Liberal government? Worries, Mr. Speaker. Worries about how they're going to pay their bills, their hydro, their rent. Worries about how they're going to make a good future for their kids. Now, the changing workplace review is in. What are you waiting for? Where's the action? Not the talk. Where's the action from this government to actually implement some changes for the people of this province? Thank you. Come here. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you very much. Speaker, the member must be a Maple Leaf fan because he knows a bandwagon when he sees one. Speaker, ah! we've, been, we've, we, we've been working very, very hard at this. Speaker, we want every family in this province to benefit from the growing economy. But even as we create those new jobs, Speaker, we need to be aware that the world of work Florida is changing. And advice. with these changes comes new challenges, Speaker. We're addressing these concerns head on through the Changing Workplaces Review. As the Premier said yesterday, it's more about just protecting people's wages and their ability to earn a good living. What we're doing, Speaker, is creating a framework for an economy that focuses on decency for workers and for fairness for those families, Speaker. Ontario workers need us to get this done right, Speaker, not just quickly. The NDP called this process a waste of time. Oh. I couldn't disagree more, Speaker. Workers in the Answer. province of Ontario couldn't disagree more. Yeah. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, if this is a hockey game, this government would get a penalty for delay of game. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, too many, too many Ontarians have reached the tipping point. That's why New Democrats have committed to a $15 minimum wage, to an easier path to, you, to the middle class through unionization, to the same pay for the same work for people working through a temporary job agency, to drug coverage for all Ontarians. We want hardworking Ontarians to be lifted out of poverty, not to be stuck in it. So what is the Premier going to do today? not for her friends, but for the hard-working Ontarians of this province who've, who've been under this government rule for 14 years. What is she going to do for them today? We need action now. Question. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, thank you to the member for the question. Uh, Speaker, we've made sure that the province of Ontario follows a very consistent, a predictable and an uh, impartial process when it comes to minimum wage increase in the province of Ontario. Correct. Contrast that to between 1996 and 2003, Speaker, the party opposite Zero. froze minimum wage Ouch. for seven years, Speaker, at $6.85. Since policy. that, since 2003, Speaker, policy we've increased Siberia. the minimum wage by more than 70%, Speaker. Wow. What we did is we went out, Speaker, 
We consulted with organized labor. We consulted with business. We consulted with poverty advocates, Speaker. We, in, we consulted with anybody that had an interest in the economy and the healthy economy of this province, Speaker. And we've got a predictable system in, in place. We're having an increase this year, Speaker, as we have year after year after Answer. year. Speaker, if this was a football game, the NDP fumbled the football. Please. Start the clock. Order, please. New question. The member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, and West Elm. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, before I ask my important question, I just want to take a minute uh, as a cancer survivor to thank the Cancer Society, who's here today doing such great work all across Ontario. <laughs> Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Uh, speaker, our government has always taken a leadership role in exploring creative and innovative ways to reduce poverty and support people living on low incomes. In the 2016 budget, our government committed to testing how the basic income might help people on low incomes better meet their basic needs while improving their education, employment and health. Speaker, yesterday morning, I was thrilled, thrilled to host the Premier in Hamilton and ministers uh, of housing and community social services uh, when uh, the premier announced details of Ontario's basic income Question. pilot. I understand the uh, plan for the pilot builds on feedback, so speaker, I want to know through you, can the minister please tell members of this house more about Ontario's basic income pilot? Okay. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and to the member for his long-time championing of this very interesting idea. Speaker, the Basic Income Pilot will be testing a new approach to income support in a careful, step-by-step -step way to ensure we get it right. We're starting small, using the lessons learned as we build the pilot out in further phases. Our ultimate goal is to better understand whether this approach could help people living on low incomes in their everyday lives. Beginning later this spring, the three-year pilot will launch launch in two regions, Hamilton, including Brantford and Brant County, Thunder Bay and the surrounding area. A third location, Lindsay, will be added in the fall. Speaker, up to 4,000 participants will be included in the pilot across the three sites at full implementation. And as I said yesterday, I'm pleased that I'm not going to be losing anything from my social assistance budget as we move Answer. forward with this important project. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. Um, speaker, my constituents were excited to hear the news yesterday, and uh, they know that though Ontario's economy is in a relatively strong position, many people in the province are not feeling that growth in their everyday lives. People are struggling to keep up with the rising cost of living and facing precarious employment with little job security or benefits. Ontario's basic income pilot will be, I think, a great opportunity to study whether a basic income can better support vulnerable workers and give people the security and opportunity they need to achieve their potential. Fantastic. Speaker, will the minister tell us more about this innovative pilot project, including who will be eligible to participate and how much support they will receive? Question. Minister. minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy. Minister responsible for poverty reduction. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for, uh, for uh, his tireless advocacy uh, on behalf of the most vulnerable across Ontario. Here, here, here. Speaker, the, the basic income pilot will help us test ways to make everyday life easier for Ontarians by removing barriers that still stand in the way of improved health, employment and housing for too many among us. Study participants will be randomly selected, 18 to 64 years old living in one of the selected test locations for the past 12 months or longer, and living on a low income. 
We're using a tax credit model, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Basic Income Pilot will ensure participants receive just under $17,000 a year for a single person, less 50% of any earned income, just over $24,000 a year for a couple, again, yes, less 50% of any earned income, and up to an additional $6,000 a year for a person with a disability. Speaker, testing Thank a you. basic income model. All right. New question, the member from Halliburton, Fort Lakes Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for accessibility. The Canadian Hearing Society provides vital services to tens of thousands of culturally deaf, oral deaf, deafened, or hard of hearing persons across Ontario. Unfortunately, an unresolved labour dispute at CHS has brought their important work to a halt for over six weeks now, which is having a damaging impact on the lives of deaf individuals in our province. For example, many seniors that cannot hear are literally shut in their homes in isolation while also dealing with chronic health conditions. These are life and death situations, Mr. Speaker. So my question to the minister is, what is the government doing to protect the deaf community in this situation, and what backup measures have they put in place to ensure that the Ontario deaf community isn't falling through the cracks? Well done. Minister responsible for accessibility. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member opposite from, uh, from the PC party for this question. It's important. I've met with this group on many occasions and have received the recent correspondence as well. They are strong advocates for the deaf community in Durham and beyond, and uh, they uh, do fantastic work, and they are pushing forward on a number of fronts, including uh, 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 visual smoke detectors. I know the Minister of Labour will con uh, comment in the supplementary on the labour issues, but I do want to acknowledge uh, the work. I think I have a meeting upcoming with them as well, so we can talk about these issues and uh, coordinate uh, our, our efforts with the Ministry of Labour. So thank you for raising the question, and the Minister of Labour will respond to the labour issues. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Foreign Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is also to the Minister of Accessibility. Members of the Canadian Hearing Society have been on strike since March 6 and are demonstrating in front of the Ministry today. Recently, Kevin Hannett from Thornhill sent an email to the Hearing Society on Spadina to request repairs to his hearing aids. The return email told him that he will be put on a wait list until the strike is over. Mr. Speaker, this is a vulnerable community whose lives have been put on hold. Will the minister please tell us what she is doing to ensure that Ontarians who require sign language translators, hearing tests, and hearing aid repairs are not left in silence? Thank you, Speaker. I, I, I do appreciate the question, Speaker, and I appreciate the member opposite for showing her support for the parties that are involved in this negotiation. I also have talked to members of the third party in this, Speaker. During a labour dispute, what the government does is focus on assisting the parties to get them back to the table. It's a shared responsibility, Speaker. We've got some of the best mediators in the country work right here at the province of Ontario. We've had somebody in. We've had somebody involved with uh, the parties. We remain available to assist them to, to bring them back to the bargaining table. What we're doing, Speaker, is we're encouraging the employer and the employees, in this case, uh, and the union, to make every effort to resolve those differences, bring them back to the table. Speaker, if, if we're confident if they work together, these parties can reach a settlement. We have a strong history in the province of Ontario, Speaker, yes, of resolving these differences without strikes or lockout, almost 99 per cent. In this case, we need to do a little bit more work, Speaker, and we will. Question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, parents, families and advocates know that we don't have a child care system in Ontario. What we have is a crisis. We don't have affordable fees for family. We don't have decent work or pay for educators. We don't have enough quality not-for-profit child care spaces. The Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care has said we need every dollar of this child care expansion going to our kids. There is simply no room for profit. When there's a political crisis, that's when this government wakes up. Uh, unfortunately, they were too late on the hydro crisis and they were too late on the housing crisis. Speaker, what will it take for this Liberal government to wake up to the child care crisis in this province? Thank you, Premier. Minister responsible for uh, early learning and child care. Minister responsible for children and youth services. Early 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for uh, this question. Now, I understand that the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care was here today to talk about uh, child care in the province and absolutely creating a safe and healthy environment and giving our kids the best start in life is the most important thing that we can do. Our plan is to transform the way that childcare is delivered in this province, and it's great to see a young Ontarian in the House today with us. Uh, we are here, you know, really as voices for uh, parents and families. We know that parents, uh, for parents finding an infant or toddler or preschool childcare spot can be very challenging. We know that current capacity isn't there. That's why we're committing to build 100,000 new spaces and transform the way we're delivering childcare in here, the here. province. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Premier, families cannot wait any longer. Parents face the highest child care costs in Canada. Child care fees in Ontario cost 50 per cent more than undergraduate tuition in the province. 24 per cent of the ECEs who are here today make less than $15, $15 an hour. Speaker, we know that public and not-for-profit child care spaces provide the highest quality, but this government won't commit to building a system based on quality. For 14 years, families have waited as costs have risen and wait lists have grown. They cannot wait any longer. When will Ontario see quality, affordable, accessible childcare system that puts children ahead of profits? Thank you. Minister of Early Years and Child Care, and I apologize. Thank you, Speaker. And, Speaker, I just want to say Senator, that please. we Thank are you. transforming the way we deliver childcare in this province. Absolutely. We are currently working on a five year rollout plan, which is under development. And what we're committing to do is create accessible, affordable, responsive, quality spaces. What we have done is gone across the province holding consultations with thousands of people. We're now in the process of making sure that our plan is good and strong. The third part does a lot of talking, but the bottom line is, even in their recent vision statement, childcare was only one paragraph of what they put out as part of their plan. So there were no timelines, there were no funding numbers. We actually have done our homework, and we're getting ready to ensure that we create a space for 100,000 new ch uh, children in childcare in this province. Good work. Okay. New question: The member from Eglinton Lawrence. To the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, Speaker. Uh, Minister, as you know, uh, last week uh, the government south of the border attacked our dairy farmers and our dairy industry. This week they attack, they're attacking our forest industry and our forestry workers. Many Ontarians are very concerned of what's happening, and they're wondering what the impact of these new exorbitant tariffs and duties that are threatened by the, the states will do to our workers in our softwood lumber exports and in this industry. What actions is our government taking to stand up to these abusive uh, imposition of tariffs and attacks on our dairy industry and especially in our forestry industry? Thank you, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence for his question. So, Speaker, I am disappointed that the U.S. government has decided to impose unreasonable duties, putting unnecessary financial pressure on, lum on Ontario's lumber producers and remanufacturers. We believe that fair and open trade is the best outcome for consumers on both sides of the border. Our government is standing alongside our forestry sector and the families that depend upon it. Our government's been working with various partners to increase the amount of Ontario wood used in large-scale building construction across the province. And that's not all, Speaker. I'm also proud to say that we've just provided $10 million in additional funding to the forestry industry to reimburse costs for road construction and maintenance on public access road. Ontario is standing alongside yes, our forestry sector to protect the well-being, jobs and important economic benefits that this sector provides for Thank workers you. and their families. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your response. As you know, many small communities throughout Ontario depend on jobs in the forestry sector. I don't have to tell you that. And I think 
we need to all stand together and saying this is not acceptable. So therefore, on behalf of not only the workers in the forestry sector, but of everybody in Ontario who's worried about these arbitrary increases in tariffs and what they're going to do to jobs and uh, this important industry, wonder what concrete steps the ministry has taken and will take to ensure we don't let them get away with this. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate the member's concern over this important issue. Our $15.5 billion forestry sector plays a significant role in 230 communities across Ontario and in the management of Ontario's boreal forests in support of climate change initiatives, which is why we recently hired our chief negotiator, former Federal Trade Minister Jim Peterson. Jim will help to advocate for free and open trade for Ontario's softwood industry. In Canada, negotiating trade deals is the responsibility of the federal government, and that's why we're asking the federal government to listen to the Ontario and Quebec forestry industries and create a loan guarantee program. And I've met with Ministers Carr and Freeland many times on this issue. We cannot let the predictability of our southern neighbour affect the jobs and well-being of people here in Ontario. Answer. As we depend against this unfair decision, we'll support our industry partners responding to their concerns and vigorously representing their industries in Ottawa and Washington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Uh, in the three years' worth of public polling your government tabled quietly in February, one poll by the Ministry of Finance found that 65 per cent of Northern Ontarians were very concerned and 29 per cent were concerned about their local economies. In total, 94 per cent of Northerners are concerned or very concerned about their local economies. Speaker, does the minister agree that developing the Ring of Fire will boost the Northern economy and alleviate some of these concerns. Thank you, Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Well, Speaker, thank you um, to the member for the question. Maybe I'll, I'll deal with the Ring of Fire piece and the supplementary, and, but, but maybe start by just talking about the difference in the level of support that has come from this government to the municipal sector, as opposed to the level of support that did not come from the opposition Conservatives when they were government from 95 to 2003. Speaker, it is very clear and it is very obvious to the municipal sector right across the province of Ontario, not just in northern Ontario, but that the financial assistance that has flowed through a variety of programs from this government starting in 2003 has better positioned businesses right across northern Ontario and has better positioned local resident taxpayers when it comes to the communities that they live in. No thanks to the work that went on with eight years of no support from a Conservative government, no but tremendous support through a variety of programs from this Liberal government since 2003. Yes, Speaker, those programs are in place, those programs continue, and local taxpayers are better Thank positioned you. as a result. Supplement. Mr. Speaker, I, I guess the minister didn't hear my question. 94% of Northerners are concerned about their local economies. That's very disturbing. Northern Ontarians need this government to do something to give them some hope. Mining, especially the Ring of Fire, offers that hope. This government has made lots of promises but delivered very little on this file. This government has more than once announced funding for transportation infrastructure in the Ring of Fire region. So my question, Mr. Speaker, would the minister please tell us how many dollars have been spent on transportation infrastructure in the Ring of Fire region, and when can we expect to see the physical evidence of some actual work being done? Yeah, that'd be good. Thank you. Well, speaker, when it comes to support for, for northern communities, you just heard the minister. Stop. You are doing so well. Speaker, 
When it comes to support for northern communities and businesses based in northern Ontario, you just heard the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry run down quite a significant laundry list of supports that we've put in place to help 230 communities in northern Ontario that rely on the forest industry, like bringing back up for our forestry roads programs that were downloaded by both the previous opposition parties, the NDP when they were in government, and the Conservatives when they were in government. Speaker, specifically on the mining sector, the member knows they want to focus on one project, that's fine. They want to try and score a few political points. You want to talk about mining? Then perhaps the member opposite can ask and speak to why New Gold has just operated a mine four hours west of Thunder Bay, 600 people on a construction site, 450 people Answer. who will remain employed in that operation once it's open. Mining is continuing to move forward. They want to focus on the one project. It's doing very Thank well. You. Exploration's up. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Workers at the Canadian Hearing Society are now entering their seventh week off the job. That's seven weeks where people who are deaf or hard of hearing are not getting the support they need to thrive. The result? People like Paul in Sudbury, who had been forced to tell his father that he's going to die, to sign to him that he's going to die, rather than be able to simply hold his hand during his final moments. Speaker, workers at the Canadian Hearing Society are here today, along with allies, fighting to have their work valued. Does the Premier agree that it's time for the employer and the union, through a third party, get these issues dealt with and let these workers get back to serving a vulnerable community? Speaker, thank you, and thank you to the member for that question. Speaker, I, I know the member opposite more than any, uh, more than many in this House. Speaker believes in the collective bargaining process. Right. Speaker, right. and we know if we can get those parties back to the table using the skilled mediators that we have in the province of Ontario, we can reach an agreement. Speaker, we always do. Ninety-nine percent of the cases uh, of collective bargaining agreement speaker in the province of Ontario are reached out without any lockout, without any strike, without any action at all, Speaker. Speaker, we're encouraging the employers and the unions to get back to the table to resolve their differences, Speaker. It's how it's done in the province of Ontario, Speaker, and it works in the province of Ontario. As I said to a previous answer, Speaker, 99%, almost 99% Answer. Speaker, almost 99% of collective agreements are reached without any action, Speaker. Last year, we had 18 work stoppages in the province of Ontario, Speaker. Thank you. But compared that to the NDP, we have Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. While this government constantly passes the puck on their responsibilities to protect workers and vulnerable populations, they have done nothing to rein in executive salaries at taxpayer-funded organizations. The CHS receives more than $20 million for services from the province each year. Unfortunately, a large portion of this has gone to exorbitant wage increases for top executives, including a 75 per cent increase for the CEO in just three years, Shameful. all the while frontline staff, many of whom are deaf or hard of hearing themselves, haven't had a wage increase since their contract expired four years ago. I invite the Premier to join me, workers and Question. allies at the rally today to support the workers of the Canadian Hearing Society and recognize the importance of their service to the community. Will the Premier finally give vulnerable Thank populations you. the respect and attention they deserve? Please. Please. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, we've got a very highly skilled mediation team, a conciliation team, Speaker, in the province of Ontario that I think is second to none. It's got a tremendous re record for helping to revolve to uh, to resolve disputes such as this. Speaker, we've been involved with the parties. If you think it's over, it doesn't necessarily mean I can't warn you or name you.
Finish, please. Speaker, my job as the Minister of Labour is to be impartial and, and, and uh, to ensure that we're doing everything we possibly can to bring these parties back to the table, Speaker. We don't like strikes. We don't, li we don't like to see lockouts. We don't like to see people Answer. not receiving the services. Last year, Speaker, 18 work stoppages. The NDP were in power. Oh, <laughs> the member from Windsor West is warned. Hi, Gavin. Okay, 139 works <laughs> off with the speaker. <laughs> no questions. Minister of, the Minister of Housing on a point of order. Yes, a point of order, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to correct my record. Ontario's new fair housing plan will expand rent controls to all private rental units, including those built after 1991. Thank you. Minister for Ottawa, the member from Ottawa South on a point of order. Very much, sir, much, Mr. Speaker. A point of order. I'd like to welcome Ron Clifton, uh, board director with the on Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, and Byron James the, from the Canadian Cancer Society, both from Ottawa. Welcome to the legislature. Thank you very much. Minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to welcome uh, Catherine Smallgang. She is a guest of Paige Kenna Smallgang, who is here in the public gallery today. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Stormont Dundas, South Bungary, has given notice of his dissatisfaction to with an answer to his question given by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care concerning high occupancy rates at a community hospital. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>